Today we are finishing up our sermon from the parables. We have the story of the prodigal son. Um, I'm going to let you stay seated for the scripture today because it's a long one and there are some commercial breaks along the way. So um, this is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read a, the very first few verses of chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. We've talked an off and on over the years about how you have to understand Jesus' ministry in the context of where it's given. He's not just teaching uh, to random people. Um, the Pharisees are always there. And so much of what Jesus is saying is trying to counter what they have been teaching. Sometimes in the scripture, you have to make a leap and sort of assume they're around. But this is an example where clearly they are there. They are pointing the finger at him, you run with tax collectors and sinners. And in response to that, he says, oh, well, how about I just tell you some stories? Okay, you Pharisees, how about I tell you some stories? And he, and he goes through the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then finally the lost son. And, you know, as Jesus would tell stories, I can imagine everybody's minds rolling. What does this mean? What does this mean? Where do I find myself in this story? And of course, as the story unfolds, the elder brother, who's unhappy about the grace that's given, is the Pharisees, represents the Pharisees, and the prodigal son who comes home is representative of the tax collectors and the sinners. In verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. How many of you have ever fed pigs? How many of you have fed pigs but don't want to admit it? <laughs> what a disgusting job that must be. And what I want you to see as we stop here is that this man doesn't just turn his back on his family and his future. Jesus is telling Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, is telling a bunch of Jewish people a story about a Jewish boy who ends up working with pigs who in the, that are in the Jewish religion are completely unclean. This young man has turned his back on everything that his parents ever tried to instill in them. Be like your kid coming to you and saying, I want nothing to do with you ever again for the rest of my life, nothing to do with your values for the rest of my life, and I am never going to step foot in a Christian church again. Verse 17 says, when he came to his senses, aren't you glad for those moments in life when we came to our senses? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, quick, before he gets away, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. The son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
And so they began to celebrate. What a great passage of Scripture. They began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother's come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send the Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. I am so glad that this story is told by Jesus. I, I'm, I'm so glad because even way back then, people were having trouble with their children. I remember when my children were little, thinking we'll never have any problems at all. Oh my. Uh, well, <laughs> um, Jesus cares about families. He cares about, about children. And, and can you imagine how the ears perked up on those listening when he began the story saying, a father had two sons. Oh, oh, I'm in, I'm in. I got kids, I'm in. What happened? It gives me some consolation to know that even back then, people worried about their, their kids. We, of course, worry about our kids. I don't know that that's gonna stop. People tell me after you stop worrying about your kids, you start worrying about your grandkids. But I do want to suggest to you, I want to give you something to think about. I have known people that have worried so much about their children that they ruined their own life, or they ruined the value of their life. Instead of spending their life praising God and celebrating their life with God, they intend instead turned their entire life into a miserable, worrying unhappiness over what their kids were doing. It's okay to be concerned for your kids. It's okay to pray for your kids, but you are responsible for your life. They're responsible for theirs, and at some point, we don't get to choose for them. They choose. No matter what they're doing, we still must live in ways where our heart is joyfully praising God and giving thanks to God daily for all that he has done well, a little sidebar here, and it's uncomfortable for me to say, but in telling this story, Jesus is quite unscriptural. Ooh. In fact, if you've ever known somebody that insisted you take the Bible literally, I have no idea what they would do with what Jesus does in telling the story. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus knew all of the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the law of Moses, and as he tells this story, he is contradicting the law and offering something else in its place. In Deuter Deuteronomy 21, we find these words. If someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they're disciplining him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of the town. They'll say to the elders, the son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among, from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. In telling this story, Jesus is saying, the judgment and the stoning and the hatred is over. There's a new sheriff in town. Thank God. There's a new way, a different way. We're going to treat those who misbehave. And let me tell you the story of the amazing grace of God. This story should be retitled, um, The Prodigal Sons, uh, or The Lost Sons, because actually both sons are lost. 
the son who takes all and squanders it out in the world, and the son who comes back uh, uh, from the field, and he's unhappy and ugly and judgmental. They are both very uh, lost. Some of us have had prodigal children. I don't know about you, but um, my parents probably would have said that I was the prodigal son. Uh, my mom, you, I've, I've told you before on an uh, end table in our uh, family room, she kept a book entitled, Where Does a Mother Go to Resign? <laughs> I'm sure that was because of my sisters, right? Uh, we have been the prodigal. And uh, we've also always been, we, we have from time to time been the older brother. We've pointed the finger. We've been un, unhappy. Um, but I think there's a sense that all of us still today, even though you might be members of the Methodist Church and here you are in worship today and we're making strides toward uh, growing our, our relationship with God, there's still the sense in our lives where, where we, need, we need to be restored over and over. We need to come back to him over and over. We need to renew our faith over and over. Romans 3 reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Isaiah in chapter 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. And I wonder if this is the passage Jesus was thinking about when he told the story of the lost sheep. What the son says to the father, give me my inheritance, is a pretty painful thing. I uh, was over at somebody's house not too long ago, and they had a beautiful view with trees and the lake and the sunset, and I joked with them that their children might, like, uh, choke them out or something so they could get this view earlier. That's, isn't that terrible? Um, I, that was somebody else that made that joke, I think, but in effect, that's what the prodigal son is saying to the father. I can't wait for you to die. Go ahead and die now, or at least be dead to me because I want the money. I don't care anything about you. The prodigal son uh, represents, his story represents something that happens for all of us. We are pulled by the world. We are lured by, by the world. Uh, we are invited away from our values to, to spend our lives frivolously. And what we find out there may be fun for a while, but in the long run, it always leaves us wanting. It always leaves us desiring to return, desirous for, for home. Henry Nouwen uh, talks about, talked about the, the sense that a human has in, in their souls, the, the longing for return. This idea of, I want to go to the place where I know I'm safe. I want to go to the place where I know I am okay. And I know every childhood wasn't, wasn't perfect, but I hope there were times in your childhood that you felt safe and loved. I remember as a young man following my dad around, hey, hey, I want to hang out. Hey, let's, he used to say, son, you have a bug about relationships. I used to wonder what I did wrong. There's this desire to be close to the people that we're supposed to be close to, and I'm so glad that later in life, you know, we got that, that worked out and that relationship, that relationship was restored. There's so much sadness in the, in the story of the prodigal son, uh, he, so much suffering, and, and almost all of it, in his case, um, is self-inflicted. And as I look at my life, I would probably tell you most of the suffering that I've experienced probably is self-inflicted as well. He loses so many things along the road, along his journey. He loses his money, his friends, his reputation, his inner joy and peace. Something very important that he loses is his identity. He forgets who he is. He forgets that he's his father's son. And instead, he's decided, I'm not worthy to be that anymore, and I'm just barely worthy to be a servant. How sad indeed that is, because the father, his arms are full of grace. He has this amazing love and appreciation for his son. He never stopped being his son. He never stopped being his father, but the son can't see it because he sees himself as unworthy. And I think of how many Christians I know, some of you may be sitting right here in this room, who are yet to understand that you are no longer considered the broken, the set aside, or the separated but you instead are considered the beloved, the loved, the welcomed, the embraced. 
if you don't understand the amount of grace and love that God has for you, it's a very sad life to spend uh, feeling uh, that, that my self-esteem is low and God certainly shouldn't love me. Maybe I should only be, be a servant when God's arms are so filled with love and grace for each of us. Well, if you've ever needed to make a change in your life and, and you kind of delayed, I think we do, we, we think, uh, I should change, I should do different, I should do better. I wonder how long the prodigal son uh, suffered in his circumstance until he decided to change. There's an old saying that we never change until the pain of staying the same gets bigger than the pain of, of, of changing. Why would he not want to go home? Well, partly because of his low self-esteem. I mean, he's just wasted it all but partly because he knows his rotten brother's there. He knows his brother's gonna give him a bunch of grief. He knows his brother's gonna give him a bunch of judgment. And we all know people like that. And sometimes we just fear the resentment and, and, and the, the backbiting and the nastiness that's going to come from those people. Last Sunday, we talked about the unmerciful servant and how... Um, Instead of being grateful for all the grace that he'd been, been given from the king, he instead uh, wanted to exact a, a judgment on this person that owed him a small sum. He focused on a small injustice instead of seeing the giant amazing thing that God has done. The elder brother is doing exactly the same thing. Instead of focusing on the fact that I'm always with the Father and everything that the Father has is mine, He's looking at the brother saying, he doesn't deserve that. That's not right. You can't give him the ring. You ever caught yourself doing that? Really, your, your life's going along pretty good, and then you hear that somebody wins an election or gets an award. You think, but that's not right. I should have got that. Or they didn't deserve that. We so quickly, so easily fall back into being the older brother every time a jealousy or, or anger, any time complaining or resentment pops up, you may be dealing with the older brother syndrome. And it is a sad thing in our life that righteousness and self-righteousness are... Mm, that self-righteousness so kind of sneaks right along behind us. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, there's a natural tendency to us as we, as we seek to follow Christ, as we seek to live a virtuous and loving life, and we, and we are moving towards him to look around and go, well, John Shirley's not doing what I'm doing. He's not acting like this. He's not working on it. Tracy Reisinger, she's not caring about these things. What's wrong with her? And the moment... We do that. All of our virtue, all of our grace, all of our Christ-likeness falls completely away because the self-righteousness pulls us back into brokenness. I believe that there is a sanctification. I believe there is a place that, that can develop in our hearts, and I hope we all find this more and more and more, where we pursue Christ, where we pursue being a person of love, and we stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. We stop pointing the finger. We stop crushing them. We stop complaining that they're tax collectors and sinners and just focus instead on us chasing, pursuing the amazing love of Almighty God. I thank God for what the Father does in this story because a difficult story takes a wonderful turn as we see what the Father does. So many Christians would have made the prodigal come and, and kneel down and beg for forgiveness. And then we would have given him a lecture. There certainly would not have been a party. And what would we be saying to the prodigal one, three, five, ten years? You already spent your inheritance. You're not getting anything. You remember when you did that? What a loser. That's what a lot of good Christian people would do. But Jesus is painting a different picture of how God treats the sinner he sees his son afar off, and he begins to run toward him, maybe shouting, servants, get the robe, get the ring, something good is going to happen, quick, get the calf, before he changes his mind. There's this amazing picture of God's embrace at a time when we feel that no one could ever love us, God is saying, I want you. It is an amazing picture 
of grace. Friends, this is a God that I can believe in. A God who stretches out his arms from the beginning of time to every person, inviting them to come to him. He never grows tired. He never grows weary. He never forces you. He waits and waits and waits. And when he sees you coming, he rushes out and he puts his arms around you and he welcomes you in. That is a God that I can get excited about. Conversion, this notion of our lives changing and becoming like God. Imagine conversion if you never get over seeing yourself as the prodigal son sees himself. If you see your relationship with God through low self-esteem, I'm rotten, I'm unworthy, God's mad, God's judging me. That's the kind of God that you take in. It's no wonder so many Christians run around pouring that kind of God out to others because that's the kind of God they've taken in. A God that's angry with them because they see themselves as somebody that probably deserves it. What kind of a conversion takes place on the other hand if you look at your, yourself and everyone through the eyes of the Father and you see yourself as loved, as being welcomed, as worth the ring, as worth the calf, uh, the fatted calf, and you take in that Father that loves like that, oh, friends, that is a life. That is a Christian life that's filled with joy and hope and excitement. So they threw a party. Does it seem odd to you to talk about God throwing a party? Um, a lot of times I still find myself thinking that uh, we, we really need to like um, be respectful and no running in church and no clapping in church and everybody wear a tie and a suit and all of that uh, because God's around and we have to be respectful. It seems funny that God's throwing a party. Does it seem funny to you? Uh, but Jesus does this over and over and over in Scripture. Uh, at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, he turns the water into wine. There are lots of parties. There's, there's lots of celebrations. In so many of his parables, he tells about a banquet in, in heaven. Now, is that exciting to you, a banquet? Probably not really, because y'all can go out to eat anytime you want, right? How many of you are going out to eat for lunch or dinner today? How many of you are going out to eat for lunch or dinner today but didn't raise your hand? <laughs> we, we, we are blessed with the Eatons. I mean, we can eat all the time. A banquet in heaven, is that all? It's like a gold harp, you know, play the harp, go to a banquet. But I want to tell you something. These people in Jesus' day lived a food-scarce life. You remember the miracle of the, the feeding of the 5,000? Bread and fish? Oh, that's great. These people often didn't know where their next meal is coming from. And Jesus is talking about a banquet in heaven, a place where people are graced and welcomed and loved. We like to have parties, don't we? Somebody mentioned to me the other day, this was not very nice. They said, I, I recognize there have been a lot of parties lately uh, about you leaving. And they were pretty clear. You know, it's not really because they're sad you're leaving. A lot of people are glad you're leaving. There are going to be a lot of parties. What if we had a party? What if, what if we had a party for no other reason than God loved us? What if you invited 10 or 20 people that you loved over for no other reason than God loved us? We just got to talk about that the whole night, how amazing and wonderful and incredible that is. Get the robe. Get the ring. Bring the dancers. We're going to have a party because the lost are found and the Father so deeply loves us. So we long for return. As I think of the word return, and coming home, I think of that old song, uh, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling to you and to me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Today, if you feel that you are far away from God, today, if you feel that you are dis 
disenfranchised. Today, if, if you uh, have, have yet to feel the amazing love of God, come home. See yourself as a son, as a daughter. See yourself as loved and reconciled. It's wonderful. But there's one other picture in this story that I think is wonderful as well. Because I think Jesus is inviting, modeling for the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the sinners and for all of us a way of living that we can be like the Father. Imagine that. In a world where everybody's pointing fingers at the tax collectors, where everybody's pointing fingers at the one that's out there doing all the wrong things, you and I can be that person that says, no, no, come here. I want to hug you. Come here. I want to love you. God wants to love you. You want to find joy in this life. Take upon yourself the role of the gracious, forgiving, loving, welcoming Father. Let's pray.